Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 846. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 5th, 2024. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could be here. We know that you make this show because you guys show up in the comments. You make some wonderful comments, and we really appreciate that. Before we get too far, I really need you to go, and if you see this on Facebook, click like. If you see this on YouTube, click like. It's free advertising for us. Please, if you're not subscribed yet, and 28% of you have not, I don't know what's going on, click the subscribe button. That's the red rectangle. Click that little bell that pops up and you will be subscribed and instantly notified next time there is a episode of Anglican Unscripted. If you've not shared this program in a long time, it, it's time. It's time to let people know that you watch Unscripted. You know, you, it, it's like coming out of the closet. I, 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 my name is Bob, and I watch Unscripted. Yeah, it's okay. Let people know. Share the link, share the uh, URL, and, and maybe they will be one day come forward and say, I'm Chris, and I watch Unscripted. It's time to get the get that 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 thing out of the closet. So, George, how are you doing this week? Well, I had exciting news this morning. I went to the cardiologist, and uh, they're going to put a pacemaker in me. Uh, evidently, uh, my heart's beating too slow. Good news is, I don't have <laughs> I don't have uh, I don't have uh, heart disease. Yeah. You're, yeah. None of, none of that stuff is just that my pulse average is about 50, mm -hmm. and uh, they did at least 24-hour tests, and when I sleep, it gets down into the mid-30s. So I'm either a marathon runner, which could be, could be, or my heart is just running slow. And so after Easter, they're going to put in a pacemaker and speed me up. Oh, uh, hopefully that'll give me a little more energy, and, and I won't be as gray. Gray uh, and grumpy. Hour. I bet Susan says you're grumpy. No, I mean, you and I well, are she getting... She sees these life insurance ads and <laughs> yes. says, you know, do we have life insurance? And I yes. point out to her, she gets better. She's better off if I drop dead now <laughs> than if I'm still around because she gets all this stuff. But, yeah, jeez. Uh, I mean, that's, you and I are, are getting older. I, it should be no shock to the audience. Uh, if you go back and you look at Anglican Unscripted episode one, you know, I, I had blonde hair at the time uh we were both a little thinner i i guess i was i was like 50 pounds heavier um but you know we've aged i got wrinkles now and um you know it, it's just part of hopefully becoming wiser i haven't i haven't become a lot wiser yet but i know a lot more than i did yesterday so yeah i i'm getting older too i also have what's called bradycardia but because i bicycle two hours a day the doctor thinks uh my bradycardia yeah, is from being a marathoner. So who knows? We'll see what happens. All right. So let's move on to the news. Uh, be sure I covered everything here. Okay. You said you wanted to open up with talking about the Southeastern Asia bishops have written a letter saying that they still oppose LLF. They're a little more vocal about it, but they don't know about the relationship with Welby anymore. Who's this Welby guy? Well, one of the things I like are people in the comments who complain that you took a half hour to get to the top story. Yeah, we do that. <laughs> yes, do. Uh, it's the age. <laughs> well, the bishops in Southeast Asia, they've got a new archbishop in, from Singapore. Mm -hmm. Well, they put out a new letter on the Church of England. Last year, when the Church of England adopted LLF, the bishops in Southeast Asia put out a criticism. It was mild. They expressed their displeasure and disagreement. This year, they put out an even stronger letter saying quite clearly the Church of England was on the wrong path and this will not stand. However, they were silent as to their relationship with the head of the Church of England, Justin Welby. So the Chinese bishops in Southeast Asia and the Asian bishops there uh, basically are keeping their, as we say, keeping their powder dry. They're whacking the institution with a great deal of strength, but keep being silent about the man leading that institution. Now, this is all ang inter-Anglican politics, but what it does tell us is that the trajectory uh, is moving against 
Lambeth and Justin Welby and the old Anglican way of doing things. When you lose Southeast Asia, which has a history of being a loyalist, come hell or high water, to Canterbury, mm -hmm. you basically have reached a tipping point of sorts. So this letter from Southeast Asia, I think is significant, both in what it says and what it doesn't say. So there may be time for Justin to pull out of this crash that he is in, but for the Church of England, there's little, little hope. Uh, if things continue the way they're going, for them to have relations with the great majority of the Anglican world. I mean, it, it says a lot if the only person willing to have a picture taken with you is Pope Francis. You know, basically all the other primates have scattered. They, they don't want to do any pressers with the archbishop. And when he's coming to town, they may be inconveniently out of town. And he's made this strange dichotomy where... 10 and 15, 20 years ago, having the archbishop come to your uh, province was fanfare. And it was a, a reason to say, we are part of this. We are part of the communion. We have a wonderful relationship with the archbishop, and he helps us get us things through the British government. And now they're like, is it worth to get things for the British government anymore? It's really interesting how uh, Welby has taken the seat of Canterbury and trashed it well you've made a fascinating connection there with francis and justin welby the next primates meeting is going to be in rome at the anglican center in rome and why would it be in rome uh it's it's not an anglican province well it's i think as we're going to have Fran uh justin welby trot out francis for a meeting or two mm -hmm. where welby's had, he's playing to his few successes. One is he's got very ex he's got great relationship with Francis. They basically are on the same wavelength. Yes, sir. Now, for many Catholics and Anglicans, that's a bad thing. But Welby wants to, in essence, leverage Francis into the Anglican equation, so that he can, in essence, forestall any more splits and schisms and things like that, where the Nigerians are saying. How dare you represent us to the Catholic Church when we think you're a heretic? So this is a bit of uh, political log rolling and, Fran and well be using one of his few strengths, which is a relationship with Pope Francis. Will it work? We'll see. Well, well I mean, why go to Rome? It, we joked about this before, but Pope Francis, eh, for all intended purposes, seems to be a, an Anglican wannabe. Um, I don't want to go too much further than that. And maybe in some darkness in his back past, uh, Justin Welby wants to be a Roman Catholic. Who knows? We shall see. Let's move on to our next story. Uh, and this is an, I mean, you have to have Twitter to, to really know a lot about what happened with the story. And I don't really have time to pull up the tweet. But uh, Justin Welby put out a tweet last uh this week last week this week where if you are inside baseball you're watching the captain of the titanic steer into an iceberg the iceberg and here's he, he says he's going to meet with a pro hamas activist hmm I can remember uh, when Queen Elizabeth said, I think it was 97, was in her speech, it was an honest horribles, a horrible a year. I think we had the Windsor Chapel fire, the death yeah. of Diana, all this stuff happened. Might have been 97, 98. That, yeah. Well, this is an, turning out to be an honest horribles for the Church of England. Each week they get hammered. It has been nonstop since January safeguarding fiasco, the LLF fiasco, the uh, con fake conversions, uh, uh, the uh, whole <laughs> business where Parliament and they're fighting the uh, government on the Rwanda and refugees and all this and that, just everything is going against them, every step, and we've got more to add today. Well, last, about two, three weeks ago, a man named Isaac Muther, who is a Palestinian a Lutheran pastor from Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And if you look him up on the CAMERA, C-A-M-E-R-A website, which is an American website that is pro-Israel and sort of records the statements and utterances of these people, 
Luther is pro Hamas. There's, he is uh, he's out there. And when well, when Muther came, he came to London to speak at some pro Hamas rallies, and he shared a platform with Jeremy Corbyn, the former Labour leader who was was kicked out of Labour by the current uh, Labour leader, uh, Keir. I want to say Keir Hardy, but it's not. No, no, uh, it's not Keir Hardy. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's got a well. He was kicked out, but Muther shared a platform with Hamas affiliated speakers and Jeremy Corbyn denouncing Israel and he wanted to meet Justin Welby and Justin Welby said no. Well, this received plaudits from uh, the Jewish uh, constituency in England, Al howls of outrage from the pro-Hamas liberals in England. And this week out of the blue, Welby announced he's sorry that he refused to meet with this fellow. No, 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 it wasn't just a sorry. The... Let's back up. It was not, I'm sorry. It was a retraction of everything. Every, You know, it was a, a two-paragraph, I am so sorry. I, I'm sorry how this made you feel, if this offended you, if this offended the Palestinians, if this offended the Hamas, and the act. I don't want you want to uh, offend the October 7th murderers. I mean, this is one big apology from Justin Welby, something he should have done for the victims of his safeguarding. Well, yeah, he's not done this for the victims of... You're absolutely right, Kevin. You've you've nailed that. You've nailed that. Welby is more demonstrably chastened by this than he is for all the things that have happened under his watch in the Church of England. Now, this occurred in the same week that Parliament was mobbed by an Islamist mob where anti-Semitic things are being projected onto Big Ben. And... Meet the following week, Welby caves on this issue as well. This is another PR fiasco. It's a moral fiasco. Mm -hmm. um, now, if Welby were one of these people, like Donald Trump says, I'll meet with anybody. I'll meet with, you know, North, North Korea. Korea. <laughs> I'll meet with Putin. I mean, I, I'll meet with anybody. I can make yeah. a deal with anybody. Mm -hmm. That sort of thing is different from Justin Welby, which is, oh, well, you're a bad person and I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to talk to the ACNA because they're not real Anglicans. I'm not going to talk to these people or that people. I'm not going to talk to conservatives in the Church of England. I certainly am not going to talk to members of the ex-gay movement. It's because Welby is virtue signaling on his high horse all the time. And now he's virtue signaling once again, it appears to me, in a pro-Hamas way. What is this man thinking? I well, I think he's thinking saving his hide. If you watch anything uh, on the BBC or any other media, which I think there's only two or three in all of uh, the UK, uh, it is extremely pro-Palestinian and pro-Hamas. And uh, it seems the police there are becoming uh, more that way, and who they arrest and don't arrest, who they threaten and don't threaten. There was a Jewish reporter uh, two days ago uh, a, a, attending a pro-Hamas rally, pro-Palestinian rally, let me be more specific, and he was accosted for wearing uh, the little uh, round thing on top. I lost my train of thought. No, it's coming back. Okay. And it didn't get any traction. The only people who got to see this uh, reporter being attacked were those who had Twitter and got to see the video feed. That was it. Never covered by the BBC, never covered by Sky News or anybody else, George. So I think the, Justin Welby just is he's trying to save his hide. Well, you know, and, and and it's far from me to comment on British secular politics, but I don't think it's a good thing that you've got an avowed anti Semite like George Galloway in your parliament, elected from Rochdale. But who am I to complain when we have Ilan Omar? from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, in our Congress. Uh, yeah, I mean, I And know. in fact, Galloway is much more, much more dangerous a figure because he's such a charismatic man and good speaker, while Omar is just Omar, you know. Well, you, you, you see that uh, uh, AOC, uh, the uh, representative from New York, was going to a movie last night. I think she was going to go see Dune. That's a great movie. you got to go see it. Dune 2 is out. And she was accosted by some pro-Palestinian uh, people on the way to the theater, and she went absolutely livid on them. 
And I'm going to try and bring that up for you, wonderful people. Boom. And uh, she's yelling and says, um, what did she say? I should read this. Left reeling AOC snaps at L uh, NYC protesters at a movie theater demanding that she call Israel's military campaign in Gaza genocides. She said and turned up and, and returned to them uh, and actually referred to them as being effed up. Uh, stop stop bothering me on my way to Dune 2. Now, the fact that Dune 2 is a, a nice political thriller itself. Um, who knows, George? It, it's a crazy world to, to see uh, these people who are indeed pro-Palestine being harassed in the streets of America. And the thing is, we could take this back to England. This will not cut any ice with the Islamists in England, Justin Welby. No. They're not one moment closer. They're, we're not any closer with uh, interfaith relations. Uh, because, unfortunately, the Muslim side seems to have been hijacked by extremists. There are decent, wonderful, faithful, law-binding Muslims in the UK and the US, probably majority. But their leaders are, it's many of them beyond the pale. Well, I, I surprise people all the time when I mention that Arabs live in Israel peacefully. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it, it's part of, it's just part of Israel society right now. Now there is obviously the Palestinians and the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and a lot of politics, but peace can be achieved because it has been achieved. Just not at these uh, these levels. We should move on. It, it, people can complain. Guys, it's 17 minutes and 40 seconds in, and you have not talked about the Diocese of Chicago closing its youth camp. And let's do that, George, because uh, if you don't have youths coming up in your church, you have no church. This is in itself a small story, but is uh, symptomatic or emblematic, if you will, of the problems facing the Episcopal Church. Democratic de demographic decline. Chicago had been one of the bigger dioceses, one of the wealthier dioceses, and it announced last week that it was closing its youth camp, it would not hold sessions this summer, it was going to mothball it, to decide what to do with the property. Invest more money into it, sell it, whatever. The reason why is that you can look at average Sunday attendance. It's fallen in almost in half in the Diocese of Chicago in the last 10 years. And the rate of children has declined even faster. So when you're down to a thousand children in a diocese, that is not enough to support a multi-million, hundred plus acre estate uh, for youth camps. Because maybe you get one in 25 kids going in the summer to it. This is something we've seen across the Episcopal Church in Wisconsin, in Michigan. Uh, many northern states have had to sell or mothball or shutter their youth camps or try to find a way to repurpose it for uh, you know, as a retreat center or things of this nature. It is a sign that what the Episcopal Church is doing is not working. The bishops of the Episcopal Church are meeting at Camp Allen in Texas this week. I think they may have just finished. And one of the things, the major issues that they're under discussion is the state of the church. And in their private discussions, which are, this, the spring meeting is always private, they basically are very frank and brutally honest about, you know, things are bad in the terms of attendance and income and morale. And what are we going to do? Well, uh, some of the smarter ones uh, are looking to get outside the liberal box, but mo many of them, the majority of the Episcopal Church and certainly its leadership at the very top is going to do same old, same old. Uh, you know, let's keep repeating the mistakes of the past and do our best to drive the Episcopal Church out of business. Well, I, no, to be honest, 815 and the leadership of the Episcopal Church does not believe they are making a mistake. They believe that the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit is revealing something new. They have a new gospel to bring to uh, the continent here of North America, and they're going to do it. And there's nothing going to stop them, even bad demographics and closing down uh, the camps. 
Well, I've not, I, I have not been to this year, this month's meeting, but uh, sources at the meeting tell me uh, that uh, we're hearing the sort of same old refrain that some bishops are saying success is not measured in the number of people or the financial strength. It's numbered in the lives that you change through social justice and advocacy. So even though you only have five people in the pews, if you can get gun control laws passed by your legislature, you're being an effective church. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that may sound ridiculous to many of us because success of the church usually is measured in souls won for Christ, lives changed. For them, it's government policies changed, social justice enacted not individuals brought to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You no, know, used to judge a, a successful Episcopal church in the Northeast by how many Vovos were parked in the parking lot. Now it's judged by how many EVs are parked in the parking lot. I, You know, we, you and I have t teased often about watching, you know, the slow, sad destruction, the train crash of the Episcopal church. It's hard to watch now when they have all the evidence in the world to show it's not working. Yeah, you, you don't need any more litmus test to show that your new gospel did not work. And you are living in a, 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 the Episcopal Church formally called the church. It doesn't serve Christ anymore. Now, there's elements to do. There are churches like yours, and there's probably churches in every diocese that are doing a fine job serving their communities and bringing people to Christ. As a large organization, the Episcopal Church is no longer doing so, and no longer seeks to. And that's the problem, George. I can remember at the General Convention in Denver, I think that was 2003, mm -hmm. or 2006, I was sitting and chatting with Fitzsimmons Allison, uh, who was a former bishop of South Carolina, mm -hmm. and he predicted all of this. I mean, it was happening at that time, but the, but the pace of decline has not altered. In fact, it's picked up in many ways. And his his point was that the Holy Spirit appears to have departed from large sections of the Episcopal Church. And in some ways, he sounded like when Pope Benedict gave his Regenberg speech about perhaps we will once again have to go into the uh, uh, catacombs or the in the minority to maintain the church. Um, so but here's the thing some bishops hear that and they appreciate that but then they say well we're just in a time of decline but then i point to other churches both episcopal and acna if we want to sort of keep in the same general churchmanship and workmanship there's some diet you know like di the churches you know, jeff walton friend of this show keeps sending me texts about a new church planted body <laughs> falls church or churro now they got i don't know half a dozen a dozen Nine, you know they ten, just keep 11. growing and yeah. growing and growing yeah. Yeah. um we i hate to be vulgar but you know my church is doing pretty well all things considered um people make it quite clear they don't want a dime to go to new york they don't want as little as possible to go to orlando they look view that as paying protection money Try not to uh, fight that battle with them, but yeah. uh, you know, we've had, say for the COVID, we've had nothing but up years, and it's not because the new ten thousand person development has been built. It's because people, one by one, are one for Christ by members, by neighbors, by things like that, and they see Christ um, at work. I remember a time when I attended a, a church in Connecticut and the priest wanted to take a Sabbath. I, I need to take my six months off and uh, with my family and do a Sabbath and stuff like that. And the church was actually mortified because they're gonna, the membership will just crash. People are going to stop coming to church because the, the draw of this church is, is the preacher. Uh, I attend a church now in Tampa where the priest has taken three weeks off so far to have a baby, you know, whatever. And the, the attendance is strong. It has not decreased at all. Uh, the only people who didn't show up last week were people who had a breakdown on the highway. You know, and it's a different time. People are seeking a real church. Back in, you know, Connecticut in the 1990s, there was plenty of churches to, to choose from that were earnest in their uh, proclamation of a transformational gospel. 
because there's so few churches that do that anymore, they're becoming very well attended because people really are seeking them out. And in Tampa, uh, I, you know, when he said he wanted to take four weeks off for a paternity leave, I said, oh boy, I don't know. I remember Connecticut. Uh, and it's doing just fine because people are seeking the gospel more than the preachers. Times are changing, George. Yeah, and this new generation of clergy, Kevin, oh, come on. Paternity leave? I know. Paternity leave. Paternity leave. What do you mean? Uh, oh, come what on. Yeah, George. Well, you know, it's geez, a different Louis generation. It's just, you know, it's just. Oh. I know. Well, uh, yeah. let's move to the next talk before yeah. I piss off anybody. <laughs> It's off anyway. We, that's our job, George. All right, let's move on to uh, this. Applies a little bit to the Episcopal Church, but it's an article we posted uh, by Graham Anderson called "Quiet Quitting in the Church of England," and that's where you, you have a full understanding that the Church of England is not on your side. It's not on the side of the gospel. Therefore, it's not in your side as a priest. It's not in your size, side as a growing church teaching the trans- transformational uh, uh, gospel. And if it's, so they're not on your side, how do you keep your head down? And here's the article that talks about that, George. This what was to a do? Surprise hit it. Yeah. It's had over 18 and a half thousand views uh, in the, about the 10 days that it's been up, which is very, very good. One mm-hmm. of the better stories and reasons and for an opinion piece it's quite good um the the point the author is making is that he's a traditionally minded priest and he is full up with all the things that a good parish rector does preaching teaching visiting administration raising money getting involved with civic all this stuff he doesn't have the time or the luxury to get involved with national church politicking and things of that nature and so And he doesn't see any return on that investment should he get involved. But the upshot has been is that he's reached a place where he no longer views his bishop as a spiritual overseer, but as a local line manager. And let me read his final paragraph to you, if I will. Due to the huge effort that is being put into the LLF process, I reckon that the institution will be maintained and the numbers of clergy leaving the Church of England will be minimized. But apart from the obvious cost of that, they will lose clergy without losing them. Clergy will resign in their hearts without resigning in practice. They will not look to many of their diocesan bishops as shepherds, but as workplace managers only. That is becoming, in my view, a very deep corrosive change in the Church of England that is well underway right now. When I wrote the title for it, usually the editor writes the title, uh, I use the American slang phrase, quiet quitting, to state uh, the uh, uh, resign in their hearts without resigning in practice. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the Episcopal Church. I've known, don't want to say overstate this, but I've known dozens of clergy who meet in my diocese and other parts of the country that I know who meet this criteria. They've resigned in their hearts. Their whole effort, whole strength is maintaining that Christian community that they have been called to lead but they no longer view, view their bishop. And, and uh, I'm lucky I've got a brand new bishop, uh, and I'm gonna say this again, because it still irritates me, who's younger than I am, <laughs> but who seems to, who has a spiritual radar. My past bishop didn't. Even though he was right on theological issues, he was a spiritual. Well, let's, yeah, 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 yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't the new guy. He didn't, he didn't so maybe cut, I'm yeah. lucky. Yeah, maybe I'm lucky. Maybe we here are locally lucky, but you know, I looked on my north and Flo- to diocese of Florida. John Howard believed the same things that uh, my bishop and the previous bishop believed, but John Howard, because of his lack of interpersonal skills, was disliked by both conservatives and liberals. He was nobody's father in God. Maybe that's overstatement, but I don't it's, think his clergy, on the whole, looked at him as a father in God. And in these difficult times, that's what you really need. One of the strengths of somebody like Keith Ackerman, for instance, was that all of his clergy, with maybe one or two exceptions, just saw him in that pit position as a spiritual leader or mentor. Um, 
and we're getting fewer and fewer of those. Yeah, there's there's less that stand out. I mean, granted, we, we were talking about two spheres, the ACNA and the Episcopal Church, but uh, to be a standout bishop in these times, you have to be able to communicate at the social media level, at the interpersonal level, and, you know, be somebody that your uh, diocese can see almost at all times. You almost have to be omnipresent in an open and honest uh, transformational communication. It's not like 300 years ago where uh, you come into town on a carriage to do your your parish visit at a small town in, in, in northeast Connecticut. Times have changed. People want to know who their bishop is and want to be sure that their bishop is above reproach, that he's doing the thing for their church, not just for their diocese. And it's a, it's a lot different than being uh, part of the old style where the bishop was uh, the, the emphasis of Christ in that diocese. Things changed. So... And this is... This um, this 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 article, for whatever reason, you never quite know what's going to be a home run yeah. uh, with opinion articles. Uh, I know uh, an article about. Uh, I know certain things will not be a home run, uh, but this one was a home run, and I give credit to the author Graham Anderson. It's not overly sophisticated, but it's a heartfelt plea. Uh, from a line of a person on the front lines of the ministry in England. So do if you get a chance, do read it. Yeah, do read it. And, uh, okay, here, a great chance to say what makes a great article in 2024 on a Christian news website like Anglican Inc. is a five to ten paragraph article where you highlight real quickly at the beginning uh, paragraph what this article is about, what your thoughts are, and to have a great c concluding paragraph, which this... Uh, Article has, I mean, and you a clickbait title from a savvy <laughs> yes, editor, right. and you've got it made. <laughs> you got a great on one of the most read Anglican websites on earth. So you you can't go wrong. You have everything working for you. Let's move on to some more news. Uh, this is an article I sent you last week. It didn't quite make last week's show. It talked about Richard Coles, who is a priest from the Church of England, and he gave an honest uh, interview to the Spectator. I don't know whoever talks to Spectator anymore. And he said, listen, I may have said the whole time that I was a vicar for the Church of England. I was celibate, even though I was living with my gay partner. And we were allowed to do that if we're celibate. I wasn't celibate. Well, surprise, 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 George. Well, the Spectator has a neat article called Show Off Vicars Are Ruining the Church of England that summarizes the story. Mm -hmm. But I think Coles talked to the Times, and Coles is a bit of a uh, uh, showman. Showman. Right. He uh, had been a, a member of a music band that is of Kevin's and my generation that I have to tell you I've never heard of. And uh, maybe it was an English group that n didn't make it to the U.S., but whatever. He he had a colorful career. He was in music. Then he, from show business, he went into the ministry. And he... Uh, had as a partner another priest who was 15 years his junior in age and he swore up and down that this was a non-physical relationship and he would write and appear on shows and he was on the british equivalent of dancing with the stars and things like that he was a bit of a showman and he's recently retired from full-time ministry the other the younger priest died at, from uh, essentially drinking himself to death i understand it i made mm -hmm. it wrong but uh, Coles admitted that, yes, all along he was lying about it being a non-physical relationship. And then Coles went on to say that, you know, for him, ministry was performance. And now he had reached the point where he wasn't really ready to get up on Sunday mornings. He wasn't really ready to do the daily grind. Part of th this whole thing, you know, that's Richard Coles. I don't know his soul. I don't know what's in his heart. But I would have thought that this was the sort of thing that would have been weeded out by a, a uh, ministry process to tell who truly has a call to serve the Lord as a priest versus who is a showman. The church needs showmen, but, you know, this is, 
this is what the spectator is saying. These show off vicars are ruining the Church of England. Um, that you know the truth, you know, truth doesn't apply to them. It only applies to you peons in the pew. Listen to me. Look at me. Love me. When it's supposed to be listen, look, and love Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> one of the bigger problems the Church of England has is it's it's teaching the gospel of John Lennon and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, in such, it's not just the, the uh, spectator showman vicars that are at issue, it's that there's just no discernment in picking these uh, people to be ahead of a church. And we've seen that that has not stopped in one iota. It happens today, not just in showmanship, but we need to pick somebody of a certain color, of a certain gender, of a certain race to be a priest in a church in downtown London. Help me out here. Who, who should we get? You know, it, it's no longer. We need to find somebody who has discerned the call of life uh, of a priest and wants us to help them in that discernment. That's gone. A general, a general synod, Justin Wilby answered a question, uh, questioning the appointments process. Uh, somebody said, you know, the bishops don't seem to have the theological depth that they once did. And Wilby said, oh, no, we have a rigorous process, this or that. And, uh, but you could sort of see the lack of discernment where Justin Wilby pushed for Paula Venels, the former post office chief, to be the Bishop of London. There were four candidates, Paula Venels, uh, Graham Tomlin, the Bishop of Kensington, one other fellow who is now the Dean of Windsor and uh, the current and the one who got the job, uh, Sarah Mullally. Um, Tomlin and the other fellow are heads and shoulders above the two women in terms of the charisma, the episcopacy. But because of uh, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion criteria, they're not included. Well, people say, well, then you should do the Episcopal system in the United States. Well, you know, the United States isn't any better. Uh, we go through these fads. We go through these things so that right now we're seeing uh, you know, Mississippi just elected a young woman, young African-American woman to be bishop. Doesn't have much experience. She's pleasant, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But Mississippi is overcoming its legacy of racism by virtue signaling to make as its bishop uh, a young African-American woman. Now, what does this mean? It means that the office of bishop isn't really that important anymore for most uh, Episcopalians. It's basically what Graham Anderson calls the line manager, the regional manager. They're not fathers or mothers in God. They are people who uh, exercise administrative oversight. They're the junior vice presidents of the large multinational corporation of which I, the local priest, has the franchise. That death of real episcopacy, I think has been what has killed the Episcopal Church over the past 50 years. I think it's what's killing the Episcopal Church today. You could translate that. That's one of the major problems of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, it's failure to uh, put good men, in the Catholics case, in positions of leadership. Yeah. yeah, there's no doubt about it. All right, what else we got here? We got to you got to start snapping together because you gave me 13 stories. So uh, Richard Coles, oh, this is the perfect story I want to talk about. Uh, back to the Church of England because the topic du jour. Uh, there's a commissioning commission that has suggested that the Church of England should apologize for proselytizing the continent of Africa. Huh. Well, there's a surprise. I never thought that would come out of the Church of England Commission. Let, let's talk about this because it, it's not just an immediate story. It's been forming for the last year and a half, George. I'll start at 10,000 feet then, okay. zero in. <laughs> Please. This is the perfect story if you want to torpedo the whole DEI racism, mm -hmm. race reparations, virtue signaling. Mm-hmm because it's blown up in the Church of England's face and is a, it is not repairable at this stage in its current form. Okay, uh, last General Synod last year pledged $100 million from the church commissioners to atone for the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade, because the uh, Church of England owns stock. 100, uh, million, 100 million. Pounds or dollars? Pounds. pounds okay, excuse right, me, 100 million pounds. Yeah. 
uh, which these days is about a hundred million dollars. <laughs> yeah, uh, really? pounds not doing too good. <laughs> yeah. um, to atone for the transatlantic slave trade, why should the Church of England atone for the transatlantic slave trade? You ask. Wasn't England instrumental in suppressing the transatlantic slave trade? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, because the Church of England inherited stock in the South Sea Company at one time, which was engaged in slaving. So being polluted by once owning stock three or 400 years ago, the church general synod decided to virtue signal and set aside $100 million for reparations, which of course it hasn't paid. And I doubt we'll ever see it paid. Well, they formed an independent committee on this issue. And a year later, this committee came back with a report saying, should be a billion pounds, not a hundred million pounds. And the church commissioners tweeted out a little little message saying, oh, we welcome this recommendation. Uh, it won't change anything here, but maybe we'll invest in black owned businesses or things of this nature. Well, the church commissioners either didn't read or didn't care about the report that came with this recommendation. Because in the section marked ethics and theology, it called for the Church of England to apologize to African Africans for converting them from their pagan religions, relig indigenous religions. When this got out, so either the church commissioners didn't read it, or they said, oh, well, this is theology. It doesn't apply to us. We're just the money men, so we can skip that part. Whatever it is, this has caused explosion. So the Daily Mail had an interview with a number of people, Prudence Daly, Ian Paul, friends of this show on the conservative side of the Church of England. Ian Paul is a member of the Archbishop's Council. who basically saying this is anti-Christian. This is racist. This is an abomination, you know. Uh, and it just so happened this came out the same time as some Midland diocese were advertising a 36,000 pound a year position, which is greater than a, a rector's oh, stipend. Yeah, yeah for an anti-whiteness officer. Now, anti-whiteness, as defined by the Church of England's advisors, whiteness is wicked, white people are evil. Um, they don't really define it, but if you, in the Church of England advert, but they're looking for somebody who will chastise the English for being white and try to make the Church of England less white. But again, this is, sheer lunacy they don't have enough money to pay clergy stipends they're shutting churches left and right mm -hmm. yet they have money for an 11 man team 11 person team to attack people for over their race this is like having the anti you know anti-jewish office of the nazi party well, it's really uh -huh. that abominable that the, you know in christ there is no slave nor free greek nor jew male nor female but there is in the church of england you know, this coming on top of the billion pounds, you know, as Ian Paul said, who would in their right mind would give money to the Church of England if they think it's going to be spent on race huckstering? Um, poor England has imported some of the worst aspects of American craziness, and this is one of them. Uh, we'll send you Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton next year. If you'd <laughs> next year. Oh, you need the Rainbow Coalition. It was the first rainbow. But now, and who, okay, here, uh, Anglican scripted, uh, speaking for the Church of England at, at this moment in time, we want to apologize for the, the Kentish pagans for Christianity coming across uh, the water uh, from Europe into to England. We're sorry for that, that somebody would have processized England. I'm sorry. George, we got that covered? We're, we, you know, we've spoken? Good, well, good. Kevin, Kevin, yeah, I, need, uh, I need reparations because my ancestors were driven out of England in uh, 1618 and had to go to the to America on the Mayflower because they were not uh, members of the Church of England. They were, uh, pro, you know, dissenters, pilgrims. And, you know, I've been forever tarnished and emotionally scarred. And for 400 years, we've never amounted to anything because of that incident, that hereditary guilt and... No, yeah. Hold on. Uh, as, a, as a mostly pure-blooded Norwegian... It's my fault. Okay, if we have not pillaged you uh, in your islands or land yet, we just we haven't got to it. So, uh, yeah, I, d I don't know where we go with this. I understand the desire to use reparations to bring peace. 
I assure you, uh, from the bottom of my heart, from all the knowledge and wisdom I've ever collected, about that much, it ain't going to work. Nobody here is seeking peace. They're seeking justice. And in man's justice, there is no peace. Only in God's justice. And it's it's fun to watch you guys play, but it, you know, in the end, you're going to have to answer to somebody who should... Yeah, hopefully that somebody good. named Jesus comes like November 1st, 2024. <laughs> well... The Church of England has gone down the road the state of California went. Yes, California, did. you know, did this virtue signaling reparations commission. Mm -hmm. uh, California was never a slave state that I'm aware of. I don't know if the Spanish allowed slavery, but you know, uh, no, it was no never African American slaves. It, there. it was never allowed in the bylaws. Some may have shown up there as Chinese slaves to help build the railroad, but no, there was no African slaves there. And. Gavin Newsom put together this reparations commission to basically to uh, placate uh, the activists. And they came back with this thing where every black resident of California is owed a million dollars by the state of California, which of course would bankrupt the state of California. And Newsom basically said, oh, I don't think so. Uh, it's the same thing. You know, you get, you give the crazies a commission to come up with a wish list of all the things they want. And then these ignorant, illiterate, silly people will come up with this nonsense. Uh, we probably talked about this many times, but here's the secret to reparations. The only way we will find peace between our peoples and our cultures and our genders is for us to be right with God. When I am right with God and you are right with God, that is the reparation. Okay, there's no other way to do it. But that's just Kevin bloviating on a, uh, his webcam. Let's move on to some other informational stuff we need to tell you about. Uh, yeah, we covered the DEI. Okay, uh, we're not the only information source out there. A lot of you think we are. Yeah, uh, George and I run Anklin Inc. We, uh, I run Anklin TV, and we both co-host Anklin Scripted. And for many of you, that's the only place you get your news. We appreciate that. And I think you, you've made a wise decision of where you get your, your Christian and Anglican news. And congratulations. There are other sites. This week, there's one less site. Church Militant has closed its doors, George. Hmm. Church Militant was a, uh, is a Roman Catholic website based in the United States that uh, took a very hard, loud line against uh, the liberal tendencies of Catholic Church. A um, fellow who used to write for us named Jules Gomez, when he became a Roman Catholic, took a job with them as their Rome correspondent. And, well, Church Militant just lost a libel suit in uh, the United States and have to pay $500,000 to someone whom they libeled. And they've announced they're going to shut the doors because they can't pay for it. Um, what this is and a libel suit is a hard thing to win in the united states you've got to show deliberate malice i think yeah and they've got emails basically saying let's get this guy which is deliberate malice um so you know kevin and i are fortunate because we don't have a half million dollars so nobody's going to bother suing us yeah well i mean yes okay well we've been threatened to be sued by a foreign person from England, uh, who just doesn't understand you can't just sue an American that easily. Uh, we are very careful in how we uh, structure our stories in the such. We will use the word allegedly a lot. And we try not to use any characteristics of a person other than blacking hair, pudgy, that type of stuff, uh, because we, we're not here to uh, make fun of people as much as uh, talk about some serious issues in a very light way sometimes. And that's the trouble uh, I can get into because I enjoy humor. I consider myself a humorist, and I could easily go over that fence and end up with somebody knocking on my door saying, Mr. Coulson. You have a hundred million dollars, don't you? So, nothing zilch. So, the only way you're going to get money out out of me is if you come to church and slip and fall in the uh, coffee <laughs> hour and drink something. Otherwise, uh, uh, 
I'm judgment proof, so don't worry. Uh, okay. But, you know, in a such, I know some bloggers uh, who try to get people. And um, I don't think that's the best way to move forward. Uh, the, the message of transformation alone uh, gets the people. You don't have to try it harder. Let's move on. We got uh, four more stories in five minutes. Million Dollar Bishop is gone. Sounds like a uh, a, a, a woody line from uh, America's Rich and Famous, George. A number of years we were writing about Brighton Malasa, Bishop mm -hmm. of Upper Shire in Malawi. Uh, he was deposed by the province, but he pointed out that he had a contract that he had to be paid till a retirement age. So that would come out to about a million dollars he would be owed, and he would take that million dollars in exchange for giving up his job. And he had a labor court in Malawi say, yeah, that's what your contract says. Well, this week, the uh, and they didn't have a million dollars. And we're not the only ones. Sat for a while. Well, this week, the Synod of Central Africa announced that uh, William Machombo, the Bishop of Eastern Zam uh, Northern Zambia, was now going to be translated to Upper Shire, which means they've got they've reached an agreement with the bishop of upper Mala, uh, upper shire so i don't think he got a million but he did get something to make him go away yeah so that story is now done done bigger story in, in, in anglican news baswane is to start ordaining women priest i'm sorry if my pronunciation in the country is a little off synod in central africa is decided to split uh, into three new provinces. Uh, Central Africa is Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and Botswana. Yep. And, and they're going to split into the provinces of Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe. And Botswana is going to decide where it wants to go. It may go to South Africa because it is more in common with South Africa. And the reason why it was stuck in Central Africa was because during the apartheid era, when the right, provinces yeah. were formed, they didn't want to be in the apartheid uh, province well uh they also voted to allow women clergy and give it a local diocesan option so malawi zambia and zimbabwe are still going to have all men but botswana is now going to have women clergy and botswana is beginning the process to ordain women they have deacons i believe they may not have well they're starting the process and they're going to have women's ordination shortly so that the last province that i'm aware of uh, I'm not quite sure about Southeast Asia, but the last province I'm aware of uh, that had no women in Nigeria, um, the number's getting smaller and smaller each year. Okay, back in the, I guess, late 90s, there was a movie called Minority Report. And in that movie, there was a, uh, it's also a good book, uh, three uh, cognitive people who could help solve pre-crime. By whatever technology at the time, they lied in some tub in the basement of some factory, and they could determine that this person is going to commit a murder. They would send the police and arrest that person and uh, try them right there, and they would incarcerate them. Pre-crime. George and I have been discussing a story today where that is now being proposed, and it's just moments away from happening in Canada, where you can be found... I can't be found guilty, found certainly of something for pre-crimes that you have not committed yet, George. Let's back up and start the story, not just from uh, Minority Report's point, but uh, this is kind of the new racism, the, the new uh, um, uh, attack on speech, the new attack on thought. Canada. Justin Trudeau's government has put forward a bill before Parliament entitled the Online Harm Bill, C-63. And its public statement is to protect children from online harm and pornography and pedophiles and whatnot. But buried in this legislation is a authorization for the government to arrest people, place them on house arrest, and to electronically tag someone who is considered likely to confit a future crime. In other words, if the judge believes there's reasonable grounds that someone might say something, not do something, this is just say something online, 
before they even say it, the government can have them arrested, imprisoned, and jailed. It's also retroactive. And that there's also, if, uh, so that someone like Jordan Peterson, who has, uh, you know, upset the transgender community because he refuses to use the pronouns they say, Jordan Peterson can now be arrested for past statements that, hear the words, that offend, hurt, humiliate, discredit, dislike, disdain, detest, and vilify someone under the law, someone under uh, covered by the act. Now, who discerns this? The person who feels the victim, disdained, the victim. humiliated, yeah. hurt. Yeah. So Justin Peterson can now be, Jordan Peterson can be arrested before he gives his next speech, or he can be arrested for things he said that are still on the internet posted, you know, five years ago. Now, what is this going to do to the Anglican network in Canada? Um, if they have a minister who is going to preach about abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism, uh, racism, and it doesn't coincide with what the government seeing, sees as the right way to think, that minister can be arrested before he even gives his sermon. Well, That's I, the state of the potential law in, in Canada. And, oh, come on, the Canadians aren't that way. Well, when Anglican Unscripted first started, I did an interview with a, a parishioner who had been sued by his Canadian bishop and lost so yes it can happen canada is just dirt see, crazy canada, yeah yes yeah, they have a thing called the human rights tribunal yeah. which is basically the enforcement going to be enforcing this thing and the human rights tribunal has basically become a woke enforcement tribunal some of the craziness that we see it coming out of canada well it's no crazier than california but no, that's, yeah that's not saying much in other words, there was a story about a 45 or 50-year-old man who joined a, a girls' swim team and was competing yeah. in girls' swimming events, and he wanted to change in the girls' locker room, 14, 15-year-old girls, and he's exposing himself and shaking stuff in front of the girls, and Swim Canada uh, was asked, why are you allowing us to have it? Well, because we can't discriminate, because this man believes he's a teenage girl. Well, he's a pervert who's well, getting jollies out of exposing himself to teenage girls. But, you know, Swim Canada is afraid of the uh, implications of the Human Rights Tribunal coming after them. But here we've completely empowered the victim. Okay, the, the accused has no rights. But in, in Canada, with this tribunal, uh, the victim has all the rights. The, the right to have a uh, someone they accuse to be tagged ankle braceleted, uh, potentially jailed, marked for future crimes. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a new standard I'd never even seen in fiction. We, we, we've gone beyond uh, dystopian when we completely empowered uh, victims like that, George. Well, there's a, a noted fellow in British Columbia who uh, it's a man who believes is a woman, and he's made a habit of going to these usually Vietnamese or Korean operated women's salons and asking for Brazilian wax, which is where they remove all the pubic hair. Gross. And, Why would you do that? Well, okay. Wants, what are, don't do anything. He wants anything. these women yeah. to do this. And he, if they refuse, well, you don't do men. He brings lawsuits and he wins because he cannot be discriminated against because of their transgender human rights laws. Gross. Leave my pubic hair alone. George, uh, we'll save the last story I have here is AI. There's a lot to discuss. That's kind of a, maybe a, its own episode in how it's regards to Christianity, but we don't have time right now. We've hit 59 minutes, 54 seconds. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 846 of Anglican Unscripted.